resurrection of Jesus is the fundamental event for Christians. And we don't believe in the resurrection just because the Bible says so. It is way better than that. And Jerry's going to be talking about that right now. All right, good morning. You guys singing good. I mean, I can hear the muffle, but that's okay, you know. And for some of you, that's a very good thing, isn't it, that, that we have that there. But uh, glad you guys are here. Um, appreciate the band and the tech team putting all this together. Uh, we finally got our lights turned on. We found the switch. And uh, so, uh, so this is kind of cool. May have to powder the top of my head for you later on or something like that. But anyway, uh, I'm just, you have to forgive me. I'm just excited today. So get to see some of you I haven't seen in a year, and of course, it's, uh, it's Easter. So anyway, so if you were to say to me, uh, Jerry, uh, I'm not a Christian, uh, I'm not a Jesus follower, I, I'm not a Bible person, you know, someone invited me, and uh, so I came today. Uh, but if you were to say to me, Jerry, why should I follow Jesus? Why should I follow Jesus? If you were to invite me into that conversation with you, and if you were to give me that opportunity, first of all, I'd tell you what I wouldn't do, all right? I wouldn't try and defend the history of the church because the church has had some really embarrassing seasons of church history when the church has done some really, uh, really strange things. Uh, I wouldn't try to defend the way that a lot of Christians or a lot of things that Christians have said or maybe the way that some people that were Christians treated you because some of them were, were very, very bad and there's no excuse for them. I wouldn't try and defend the values of certain Christians that certain Christians have or the way that certain Christians talk or the way that Christians treat other people. I wouldn't even try to convince you with the Bible. Uh, I wouldn't say the Bible says because as we're going to find out, there were thousands and thousands of, of believers in Jesus before we ever had a Bible. So I wouldn't start with that. And if you were to give me the opportunity to uh, try and convince you today to become a follower of Jesus, I would start with the event that we're celebrating today with over 2 billion other believers around the world, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And like I said, I wouldn't start with the Bible because there were thousands of people who believed that Jesus rose from the dead before there was ever a Bible. In fact, there were people who believed Jesus rose from the dead that very first Easter morning. And when Jesus rose from the dead... The people in the vicinity of Jerusalem did exactly what you would have done and did exactly what I would have done if we had seen someone die and if we had seen them buried. And a few days later, we saw them walking around and, and, and talking with people. They took to social media. It, now, it was the social media of first century Jerusalem, which means that they talked a lot about it. And some of them even began to write it down. And they wrote down everything that they saw and heard. So we believe that Jesus rose from the dead because a man named Matthew, who was a follower of Jesus, after the resurrection, sat down and wrote everything that he had seen and heard during the life of Christ. We believe because of a man named Mark, who knew one of the closest followers of Jesus, and he sat down with that man, and he, they wrote down a, an entire chronological account of the life of Jesus as eyewitnesses. We believe because a man named Luke, Wrote, wrote a gospel, and he began it by saying this, I have decided and I have endeavored to write an orderly account of all the things that have happened. We believe because a man named John, another Jesus follower. John was one of the earliest uh, commits to the, to the teaching of Jesus. He was an eyewitness from the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And on that first Easter morning, John was one of two guys that looked into the tomb and saw that it was empty. Later on in life, he realized that he needed to write down everything that he had seen and heard so that people would have a record of it. We believe because a man named Peter, who also with John, looked into the empty tomb that first Easter morning, and he began to write down and share what he saw. Maybe the most compelling witness of all was a guy by the name of, of James. James was the brother of Jesus. Let me ask with a show of hands, how many of you have a brother? Right, raise your hand. Okay, let me ask you this question. What would it take for your brother to convince you that he was the son of God? <laughs> okay, I, I mean, it, the, the story of James is just crazy. And the interesting thing about James, now remember this, the brother of Jesus, is that James was not a follower of Jesus while Jesus was alive. He didn't believe it. 
But after Jesus rose from the dead, James becomes a believer, and he actually becomes a leader in this early spiritual movement that becomes, comes to be known as the church, and he, he writes down some things, and you can read them in Scripture. And he is absolutely convinced now that his brother is his Lord and Savior and that he rose from the dead. I believe, we believe here because there was a guy by the name of Paul. Paul, secular historians will tell you that Paul was one of the most prolific writers in, 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 first, in the first century. He spent most of his early adult life as someone who was uh, violently opposed to Christianity. But Paul later came to believe that Jesus actually physically rose from the dead. And he didn't believe it because the Bible said so, because they didn't have a Bible at that time. And I don't believe the, re the story of the resurrection simply because the Bible says so. But as I said earlier, it's way, way better than that. We believe it here because these men who lived in the first century who knew Jesus and either were eyewitnesses of the events or they knew people who were eyewitness of, event, of these events wrote them down at that time. And if I was having this conversation with you, I'd tell you about one other a man, a man some of you have probably heard of from history. His name is Nero. And if I was to ask you to list all of the Roman emperors that you know, you might come up with one or two, but one that just about all of us would remember is a guy by the name of, of Nero. We don't know much about the battles that he fought. We don't know much about the laws uh, that he passed and, and had written. Uh, but there are two things that historians emphasize about Nero. One is something that you all probably know is that Nero burned his capital city. He burned the city of Rome. He's known for that. The second thing historians tell us is that Nero blamed the Christians when Rome burned. Blamed the Christians. Now, now this story's not in the Bible. It's recorded in secular history. So Nero burns R Rome down, and he decides to blame it on the Christians in Rome. And from that point, a persecution of the Christians began and goes throughout the Roman Empire, and Nero, Nero was behind it. And if we were having this conversation about why you should follow Jesus, I would ask you this question. I would say, why would Nero persecute Christians in the city of Rome 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus. Rome is like 1,500 miles from Jerusalem. So, so why would he persecute Christians in Rome 1,500 miles away 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus? And this is important because people have studied how long it takes for a myth or a legend to develop from something that, that happened. A myth or a legend is something that happened and over time it gets told and retold and the story shifts a little bit and it gets exaggerated and then it gets exaggerated again. And before long, what it comes out is is something that never really happened. And, and, and so there's people who say, you know, this story of Jesus and the resurrection might be myth or legend. But study after study concludes that it takes about 60 to 80 years for a story to become something that people think is made up. Uh, it, it, it become a, a legend that people believe. The reason it takes so long is because all of the people who were eyewitnesses to the real event, the beginning event, actually have to die before someone can come along and say, well, that never really happened. Or it didn't happen like that. So history tells us that when Nero looks for a group of people to blame when Rome burns, there were thousands of Christians living in Rome most of whom were not Jews, but were Roman citizens who had heard of the resurrection of Jesus, had, had, had met some of the, the early Christians, and they had come to believe that, uh, that Jesus had risen from the dead. All right? Uh, so so the, the, quest, the answer to the question then is really simple. There were thousands of Christians in Rome that believed Jesus rose from the dead, and Nero could blame them simply because they were there. And remember, they didn't have a Bible. They didn't have a Bible. You see, on the day that Jesus died, when Jesus was crucified, everybody unfollowed Jesus. There were no Jesus followers right after the crucifixion. And here's why. It's not because they didn't appreciate all of the amazing things that Jesus taught. And it's not because they didn't just love the way that he interacted with people and cared for people. The problem is, when Jesus was alive, he had claimed so much about himself. I mean, seriously, if, if you say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life... You can't die if you say you're the life. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And if you say you're the resurrection and the life, you can't die. He said that he was the son of God. And the son of God can't die. And the son of God is certainly not going to allow somebody to, to, to bury him. So when Jesus was crucified and when those who were following him watched him die, their faith was gone. It was over. There were no Christians after the crucifixion. There, there were sympathizers 
But there were no Jesus followers after the crucifixion. And they certainly had no message worth repeating. I mean, what would the message of a Jesus follower be after the crucifixion? Well, he taught some great things and he healed some people, but he's dead. There's certainly no message worth repeating. And I would like to remind you that in the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and what Peter wrote, and what James wrote, and what Paul wrote, nobody wrote themselves into the story later as some kind of hero. You see, if a bunch of us got together and we were making this up, one of us would claim to be the hero. Jesus would come back to life, and one of us would write, you know what, nobody else believed it, but I believed it. I knew it was going to happen. But nobody does that. They all say none of us believed he was coming back. None of us believed we would ever see him alive after Calvary. And no one was standing outside the tomb that first Easter morning counting down 10, 9, 8. Nobody. So they heard the words of Jesus and they watched the miracles. They saw how he interacted with people. They saw him arrested. They uh, watched the phony trial. They watched from afar off as Jesus was nailed to the cross, all of them. And they knew that Jesus was buried in a tomb and that a large stone had been rolled in front of it and that some Roman guards, the Roman soldiers were standing guard. And while all of these people were eyewitnesses to all of these things that I've talked about today, they all agree on one thing. They all agree on what happens next. And John takes the lead in this and he tells us what happens. He says it this way. He says, early on the morning, or early on the first day of the week, excuse me, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So Mary's going to go back and, and, and see that the, you know, this stone that was protecting the body of Jesus is gone. Now Mary Magdalene, most of you have heard of her, she was a woman who, who Jesus had healed and she began to follow him. And when he died and was buried, she was just devastated. I mean, this was a man who had done so much for her. She was grateful for everything that Jesus had done. So she decides to go to the tomb that first morning, first Easter morning, to get someone to move the, the stone so that she could make sure that the, the proper preparations, the embalmment, had been done right. My theory on this is that the, the first preparation, you remember when Jesus died, that Joseph and Nicodemus were given permission to take his body down. They had to do it fast because the Sabbath was coming, the evening of the Sabbath, and so they did it fast. And so Mary was just concerned that, that all of the preparations weren't done the way they should, so, so she wanted to see that it was done. And, and, and John writes that when she got there, she sees that the stone is gone. Now, she doesn't look inside. She, she sees that the stone is gone. And, and, and what's her assumption? What was her assumption that Jesus was alive? Was her assumption that Jesus had risen from the dead? No, her assumption was that somebody had broken in and had stolen the body of Jesus. Remember, no one's expecting a resurrection. And John says, here's what's happened next. And, and John's writing this first person says, she came running to Simon Peter and back to me, back to John. And when she gets to them, she doesn't say, hey, he's alive. He, he's risen. He's risen. No, she runs back to the city. She runs back to where Peter and John are hiding. And they're hiding because they're probably thinking, you know, if they got Jesus and we were his followers, we may be next. So they're, they're hiding out. So she runs into that place where they're hiding. And she says, they've taken the Lord, the body of the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they've put him. So Peter and John, they take off and, and go to the tomb just outside the city of Jerusalem. And they go to the place where, where, where Jesus was buried. But they take it a step farther. Okay, they actually go and look in the tomb, and it's empty. It's empty. And, and, and John tells us, if you read it yourself, that they simply go back into the city because they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to think. They didn't know what to believe because they weren't expecting a resurrection. Meanwhile, while this is going on, Mary makes her way back to the tomb and stays there. And if you will for a moment, can you maybe... Get a handle on a little bit of her emotion at this moment. I mean, here was a man who had changed her life. He was the greatest man that she had ever known. And now he's dead. And not only did they kill him, but she said they wouldn't even leave his body alone. Someone took his body and they stole it. And John writes that she was just distraught and, and, that, and that she was weeping. And so she goes and she looks in the tomb. And she looks in the tomb and, and she sees two angels there. 
Now, she didn't know that they were angels. She just described them as, as men. Uh, one of the questions I get asked a lot as a pastor, I've actually had people ask me, you know, are, are angels men and women, men or women? And, and, and so these angels ask her, why are you crying? So I know that these angels were probably men because only a man would ask a woman, why are you crying? Okay, so, um, so that, that's just a little resurrection humor there. So uh, sorry about that. But anyway... They, these angels say, why are you crying? And, and, and listen to what she says. Remember, she's heartbroken. She's sobbing, and she says, they have taken my Lord, and I do not know where they have put him. And again, nobody's expecting Jesus to come back from the dead. And then she hears a noise. And John writes that she turns around, and she saw somebody standing there, but she didn't realize who it was. Remember, it was still dark. It was still dark. And maybe there was some distance involved. And, of course, she was an emotional wreck, and she was sobbing. And, again, she certainly wasn't expecting Jesus. And so she turns back to the tomb, and the voice asks her, Who is it that you're looking for? Who is it that you're looking for? And John writes that Mary thinks it's the gardener, the person who's tending the, the graves or the, the cemetery area there. And you remember why she would have thought it was the gardener? Because she wasn't expecting Jesus to be alive. She wasn't expecting a resurrection. Anyway, so she turns and she looks at him and says, Sir, if you have carried him away, if you know where he is, would you tell me? And I will go get him. I will go get him. And then Jesus simply says, Mary. And she hears her name, and she hears that voice, and she puts it all together. And all of a sudden, everything made sense. And everything changes. And now she runs back to town with another message. And the message this time is, I have seen the Lord. And though nothing in the city of Jerusalem had changed and nothing in the Roman Empire had changed, nothing in her life circumstances had changed, everything had changed. And when Jesus rose from the dead, it changed everything for you and I as well. It is the context, the resurrection of Jesus is the context for every decision a believer in Jesus makes. It is the context for every relationship we enter into. It is the context for everything that happens in our lives. For instance, because of the resurrection, you can pray knowing that God hears your prayers because the Jesus who rose from the dead tells us that when we pray, God will hear our prayers. When Jesus rose from the dead, it validated absolutely everything he had ever said. And so many times now, if, if you're a church person, you come and, and they say, and Jesus taught this, and we go, yeah, and we kind of give it some kind of verbal assent, and we kind of agree. But you've got to understand, when Jesus said the things he said at the times that he said him, they were so radical. For instance, Jesus says something like this. He says, forgive people who hurt you. Forgive people who hurt you. In first century Rome and all of the known world at that time, the standard if somebody did something to you, was you got them back. In fact, it was codified. It was called an eye for an eye. That if somebody did something bad for you, you had every right to get them back. And Jesus comes along and he says, hey, when somebody does something like that to you, forgive them. Forgive them. Jesus said, love one another. No one had ever said that before. And Jesus told them to love their neighbor, and, and, and they thought, well, maybe he means the people that are just like me, and he would tell stories that, no, it's people that aren't even like you. You're to love them, and you're to care for them as well. He, he, t he said things like, give to the poor, not so that other people would see you and notice you and, you know, applaud you and all this tiny thing. He said, give to the poor simply to please God. He took that love one another and love your, your neighbor a step further. And he said, love your enemies. Love your enemies. At a time when the religious leaders would get in the temple and they would stand up and they would make sure they were dressed so that everyone would notice them and they would get everybody quiet and they would pray real loud so everyone can hear them and they waited for everyone to be impressed by the way that they prayed. Here's what Jesus said. He said, pray privately and simply. And then in a culture of that time, as in our time, when they believe that it's important to build up and get as much stuff as you can and hang on to it and build storage places for all it. Jesus said this. He said, don't store up treasures on earth, but store up treasures in heaven. And when you read it after the resurrection, all of a sudden, those aren't just good ethical moral teachings anymore. 
They're the very words of the Son of God. And then Jesus said something else that's so important. He looked at him and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And when he says that, we know that he's telling the truth. And Jesus taught us about heaven. And he taught us that heaven is a very real place, just as real as the earth that we're on. And not only that, but he said, if we will put our trust in him, that he will go and prepare a place for us there so that we can live with him and his Father eternally. And then Jesus issues what I believe is the greatest invitation in all of history. It's an invitation to a life of adventure, an invitation to a life of trust. And he says this. He said, hey, come on, follow me. Follow me. And you know what? None of that made sense until he rose from the dead. And suddenly, it all came together. And suddenly, everything changed. And here's the best news of all. Because Jesus rose from the dead, if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, I would encourage you today to seriously consider doing so. Because the issue is no longer what a church has done to you. The issue is no longer what some Christians said or how they acted in a very unchristian way. The, 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 the issue is no longer how some Christians value some things that you don't value. The issue is whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. And so if you and I were having this conversation and, I was ask, and you were asking me why you should follow Jesus, I would say, please remember, no matter what you do, no matter what you think about what I've just said for the last 20 minutes or so, there is really only one issue, and that's who is Jesus? And on that first Easter morning, that question was answered. He is exactly who he claims to be. He is Jesus, our Savior, the Son of God. And you know what? If you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, everything changes in your life. In that case, you can't pick up a Bible and see the things he taught and say, well, I really like that, but you know, I don't really like that. If he's who he says he is, we take everything he said very seriously. You can't set aside any of his teachings because a person who says, I'm going to die and then I'm going to come back to life and they actually do it, <laughs> they've proven who they are. He's proven his divine authority. He's proven his right to be listened to. And what that person says when he says, follow me, come on, follow me, that demands a response from each of us. And I don't know all of you that, that are here today, but I would say this, the wisest thing, the wisest thing that you will ever do is to respond to Jesus with, yes, I'll follow you. Yes, I'll follow you. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful today that we are part of a, a host of people, billions around the world, that have taken the day and set aside this time to celebrate the most important event in all of history. We, we, we celebrate Christmas and it's a good time and we have other religious festivals and celebrations and things like this. But Father, this is when it all comes together. This is when it all begins to make sense. And Christianity makes a break from all of the other religious and faith systems of the world. Because the person who began the movement, Jesus Christ, came to this earth from heaven and he said, you know what, I'm going to show you how to live and I'm going to teach you how to live, but then I'm going to die. But don't worry, I'm coming back. And when he did, everything changed. Everything changed. God, I pray in the lives of, of Christians that are in this room today, God, I pray that they'll realize the importance of the resurrection in a way that they never have before. And they'll say, you know what? I need to look more seriously at the words that Jesus taught. I need to make sure my life is a, is a, is a mirror of the life that Jesus lived for me. And then, God, if there's one in here today or more in here today that have said, hey, Jerry, I identify with what you said to be, and I'm not really a Jesus person, don't really know about the Bible. But I want to seriously consider the claims of Jesus today. God, right now where they are, they can say, God, I realize today that Jesus is the Son of God. I want to place my faith and trust in him as my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. And I want to spend eternity with you. I want to say yes to Jesus' invitation to follow. And God, they can do that right now. 
in the quietness of this moment. But Father, we are so thankful for this story. We're thankful for this church. We're thankful for the opportunity to see each other again after a year, uh, to see new people and meet new people. But most of all today, we don't want to ever forget the most powerful, beautiful, wonderful name there is, Jesus. And we are so thankful for Jesus today. We pray this in his name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.
saying his name just brings a smile to my face. Say Jesus and the hope that he brings. Lord, we are grateful. We are so grateful for what you've done. Let this song be of our heart. In your name we pray. Amen. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silence the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring. The praise of 